All right, we're here in First Thessalonians chapter 5, where we're at, uh, as I mentioned, the first half of this chapter is speaking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the second half, we get into where Paul is writing to the uh, church, and he gets to a point where he starts to exhort them, he starts to uh, beseech them and urge them to do certain things. And uh, what we would pick, at, uh, pick up at, I'm not going to, it actually starts in verse, uh, I would say 14, as well, as well as verse 12. But verse 14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. So now he's just throwing out, uh, throwing out, just random things here, and they're not just random as if they have no value, uh, value for anything. But um, here he says, "Pray without ceasing." In verse 17 and verse 18, he says, "In everything, give thanks, for this is get in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you." And then verse 19 says, "Quench not the spirit." But this is where our um, lesson will come from today. What he says in verse 20, he says, despise not prophesying. Despise not prophesying. So that's the title of our lesson this evening, despise not prophesying. So I want to, for one, just start with the word despise, right? What, what does that mean? You probably hear it, you probably know the meaning of it, but just in case uh, someone don't know the meaning of despise, it, it has multiple meanings to it. For one, one says to look down on with disrespect, okay? So you look at something and you just have no respect for it at all. But then the second one says to regard as negligible, worthless, or distasteful, okay? So think about that, and I want you all to remember these words because I'm going to uh, come back and I'm going to reuse some of these words to regard as negligible, worthless, or distasteful. But then it says, um, again, open dislike for someone or something considered unworthy of one's concern or respect. Right, that, that one right there is really deep. I'll read that just in case you missed it. Open dislike. This is an open dislike for someone. You're not trying to hide it or anything. It's just an open dislike. Open dislike for someone or something considered unworthy of one's concern or respect. The way, the way I look at that is that it's not even, you're not even worth my attention. I don't even consider you. So that's another word for despise. So with that being said, notice what the Bible says in verse 20. Despise, but notice this, not prophesying. So despise, not prophesying. Well, remember what despise means. It means to uh, not have any respect for. It means to have an open dislike for someone or something. But then notice what he says, despise, not prophesying. Well, what does that word prophesying mean? Simply, prophesying, if, if, you, think of, if you think like me, I, even to this day, whenever I hear the word prophesying, I can't help but to think about the Pentecostal movement. Because that's where usually you hear that word prophesying at. And usually what, when I heard prophesying, when uh, I was familiar with Pentecostal movement and everything, uh, what I heard was that when someone is prophesying, it's where they have a bunch of people come up front and they're laying hands on people and they're saying, the Lord is going to bless you. The Lord is promising to uh, bring you a new job. The Lord is going to make you a millionaire by this time next year. The Lord said he's going to heal you. And, and, and to tell you the truth, they're just lying. Yeah. You know, I, I remember some years ago, I heard this word that said prophesying. Right? <laughs> prophesying. You, you, you're lying on God. You're not prophesying. You're prophesying. All right? And that's normally what they're doing. They're not, they're not really prophesying as far as preaching the word of God. They're lying on God. God did not say he was going to heal that person. He didn't say that. God did not say he was going to make that person rich. They're prophesying out of their own heart. I'm not going to develop this right now, but in Jeremiah chapter 23, a great deal of that chapter is talking about that, where people are saying the Lord said something and the Lord is going to do something, and the Lord said he has not spoken to them. You know, they're lying on him. So normally when I hear prophesying, that's normally what I'm thinking about, where people are just, they're more fortune tellers than anything. That's what it sounds like. 
But then, what is biblical prophecy? What is that talking about? Biblical prophesying is simply, just to put it in, in simple terms, it means just preaching God's word. Just opening up God's word, whatever this chapter is, whatever the verse is here, and literally just preaching what the Bible says. That is, and of course, you can have prophecy in reference to future terms and all. I'm not getting into that, but just simply what it means to prophesy. It means just to preach God's word. Right. That's simply what it means. Amen. Right? But then, <clears throat> but then this is where it gets deep because prophesying means to preach God's word, right? And he just wrote and said, despise not prophesying. So just don't despise preaching Amen. is what he's saying. But then not only that, consider the audience. Who is the audience written to? Who is this written to? Church. The church. Amen. So he's writing to the church, and this is interesting that he has to write to the church and warn the church not to despise prophesying, not to despise preaching. He has to write that to the church. And remember what it means to despise something. It means to look down on. It means to uh, regard as negligible. It means to look at as worthless and distasteful, to have an open dislike for something. So when he's writing to saved people, he's telling saved people, don't despise prophesying. He's telling the church that when the preached word is going forth, don't look at it and have a dislike. Don't listen to it and, and consider it distasteful or negligible or something that's worthless or something that means nothing to you. He's saying despise not prophesying. Amen. But then, as I mentioned, he's writing it to the church. And he says despise not prophesying. With, with me, I've read this so many years, but this time around, for some reason, it caught me in my tracks because these verses really get short. And I know how it is where you just want to get done with a chapter. But wait a minute. It's only three words in this verse. And it's very easy to just breeze over it. Yeah, despise not proper signs. Wait, slow down. Listen to what that is saying. Despise not proper signs. Consider the audience that he's writing to. Writing to the church, telling saved people not to disregard or look at God's preached word, not to despise the proper signs that will come forth. And you will have to ask the question and say, well, wait a minute. Are, are you saying that if he writes and say, despise not prophesying, are you mean to tell me that saved people can sit in the midst of a sermon and start to develop a despising attitude? Are you mean, because it's written, these not just, just vain words. Right, yeah. So you would have to just say, well, wait a minute. If he's warning us and exhorting us not to despise prophesying, that means that a saved individual can very well be in church, yet have a despisement toward the preached word of God. Right. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. We, we should expect the unsaved and the world to despise God's word, right? right. Shouldn't you expect that? Yeah. I mean, how many times have you gone so and as soon as they open up the door and see you holding the Bible, they just slam it back? Yeah. <laughs> many times to me. Amen. So I'm sure it happens to me. Many people, they just despise the word. And, and in a way, it used to, early in my days of so and it used to bother me. But then now it, it doesn't bother me. You just move on to the next door. But you expect that from the unsaved. You expect that from the world to just look at the things of God and just look at it and have utter contempt for it, have a disdain, disdain it for it, and consider it just worthless. Not only that, the Bible says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. See, we consider that word to be power. We consider that, hey, this is the gospel that saved me. This is the gospel that cleansed me from all my sins. Amen. But the world, you expect them to hear the preached word of God and just consider, oh, this foolishness. Uh, some, some guy dying on the cross for your sins. Oh, you pay for your own sins. Uh, some guy, that's a, that's a fairy tale. They're looking at it as foolishness. But we say that's no foolishness. That's the power of God unto salvation, unto all that believe. Amen. That is the gospel that saved me. Right. But expect them to have a despisement toward the word of God and just want nothing to do with the word 
of God. But, as I mentioned, expect that from the world. Expect that from the unsaved. Amen. But saved people, remember, who is this written to? The church. Right. But for saved people to have a despisement for the word of God, that's out of place. Amen. That, that should be something that should not be happening. Expect that from the unsaved. But a person who is cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, who can sit up and listen to the word of God and have a despising attitude towards it, that's a problem. Yeah. And it can't happen. Why? Because the warning is written to the saved people here. This is something we have to be on guard against. So you say, well, how does that look? How does a, a despising attitude, how, how does it look to despise God's word? To despise, as he say, despise not prophesying. How does that look? Well, let's, let's find a, a few examples. Let's go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, this is the first example we're going to see where people are despising prophesying. We have the preaching of, of Stephen. And really, uh, out of the book of Acts, this primarily for me, this is my favorite chapter in the book of Acts right here. Um, here in Acts chapter 7, we have Stephen who's been chosen as one of the seven as in the early days of the church where there were some issues between the Hebrews and, and the, the Grecians with, the, with the, uh, the widows. There was an issue and they needed to look out among themselves men, right? And, and they ordained seven to be with them, to, to help them out. Stephen is one of them. And Stephen in chapter, in chapter seven, I really like this because he starts with Abraham and he worked his way all the way through the history of Israel. He hit Abraham. He hit, uh, he hit their time when they're in the wilderness with, with Moses. Then he's hitting Joshua. And then he hits David and that temple being built. He, he marches his way through the history of Israel. And, and really when he's preaching, there is no problem. It, it's silent. People are probably agreeing like, yeah, Abraham. Father Abraham, yeah, no problem. But then he says something that really hits him in the, in the gut pretty good. Beginning that verse, and we're going to make a comparison uh, to Acts chapter 2 with this. But you, we see something that hits home with the people. Look at verse uh, 49. This is a quote from, from the Lord himself. He says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, said the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Have not my hand made all these things? If he was to stop there, they would be amen in there. Hey, great job, Stephen. But then notice the, verse, the next verse. Ye stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which other prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, notice this, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice. Excuse me. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. So what do we see? Stephen is preaching, no problem, but then he starts to tell them, yeah, you killed the Lord Jesus Christ. He stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart. He just really started laying into them. And, and what is their response? They gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, before I hit this, let's uh, turn. You don't have to turn it if you don't want to, but Acts chapter 2, I want to go to, to the famous preaching of Peter. Because Acts, Acts chapter 2, you look at verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, when you go back, it, it speaks about it in the previous verse. He says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
So does this hit home? He says, you crucified him. He, he's the Lord and Christ. You killed him. But then notice verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Well, this is very similar to the days of Stephen. When they heard that, they did it not cut them in their heart? But notice the different responses, though. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Notice verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and, believe, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So what did they want to do? They wanted to get right with God. Right. When they heard the preaching, they asked him, what shall we do? What shall we do? Well, that's a great response. These people are not despising the word of God. They're looking at the word of God saying, hey, that's, that's true, and, and, he, and we see that there's forgiveness because they're asking, what shall we do? He's telling them how to get right with God. You crucified him. Now you just need to believe on that Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you need to do. But going back to Acts chapter 7, notice what they did. It said that they gnashed on him. This is while he is preaching. Mm -hmm. They gnashed on him with their teeth. What does that mean? Oh, I can just get to him. Gnashing on their teeth. Not only that, but then verse 57, then they cried out with a loud voice and stop their ears. How does that look? La, 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 I, I can't hear you. Yeah. Stop their ears. Talking about somebody who despises the word of God. Yeah. yeah. Someone who will stop their ears. This is an example of someone who is despising God's word. They're angry. They, they, they're gnashing on him with, it, with their teeth. They wish they can get to him because they're angry. Then just decide, we're just going to stop our ears. We're not even listening to you. You say, well, what's, what's the big deal? Well, we too, if we're not careful, can find ourselves. We may not physically show the anger right. that these people show, but what about internally? What about what's going on in your heart when the word of God is coming forth and, and something is getting hit on that is stepping on your toes or so? Right. And you very well can be there with a smile, but inwardly you are like, oh, I, I hate this subject. Right. <laughs> very yeah. well you could do that. Yeah. How about this? You may not physically stop your ears like these people did. They had no shame at all. You may not physically stop your ears here in service, but you know what you could do? One ear, not the other. Yeah. One ear and not the other. Yeah. Wives obey your husband. One ear and not the other. Husband love your wife. One ear and not the other. Yeah, you're not stopping them physically like these people did. But yeah, spiritually, you could just say one ear and not the other. I don't receive that. Yeah. I don't receive that. So what is that? That's a, that's you're despising God's word. You're right. despising the preaching that is coming forth. We see Stephen. Let's look at uh, John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. One example of someone who is uh, having this issue of despising is where you have this attitude of stopping your ears and, and you're not receiving what's coming forward with the preaching. Here's another with John the Baptist, Gospel, uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, we have John the Baptist. He's in, in the wilderness, and, and he's preaching. Many people are coming out there, and they're listening to John the Baptist. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ even speaks about the ministry of John, how when people heard him, specifically, he calls out how the harlots and the publicans, they repented at the, at the preaching of John. They got right. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ when they heard John the Baptist preaching. They were receiving it gladly. They weren't despising the preaching. But then there was a different group of people. There was a different group of people who came as well. And these people figured that they had it already. They, they came to hear the preaching, but they came with an attitude as if they had it together. They knew everything already. My question is like, why even come? I know the answer. You can find out the answer in Gospel of John. But you just ask, why you even show up? 
Why even come to the preaching service if, if you already have it figured out? You say, who were those people? Well, look at the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. Look at verse 5. The Bible says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Notice this. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. <coughs> we have a group of people who showed up and they figured they had it together already. John is telling them that they need to bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Is he telling them that they need to repent of their sin? No. That's not the repentance he's talking about. You say, well, what repentance is he talking about? Well, the very next verse, because that verse doesn't end with the period. The very next verse continues and says, and think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father. That is what they need to repent of. They need to repent of this thought that we have it together because we have Abraham. And he said, don't think that Abraham is going to be your savior. Don't think that you're settled and safe because of Abraham, because of some ethnicity. That is not going to cut it. So he's telling them, you need to change your mind. You need to believe on that man who's coming behind me, whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to tie, untie. Listen. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is what he's saying. But what did they say? We have Abraham to our father. Well, that's what John warned them about. Think not to say within yourself. They didn't even say anything. And it's amazing how John know their thought already. Think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father. You say, well, they would never say anything like that. Oh, really? You don't have to turn to the Gospel of John chapter 8. The Lord Jesus is speaking to them. He says, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. And notice what they tell Jesus. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what John told you? Amen. Think not think not within yourselves to say, well, I don't want to butcher, excuse me. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. And what did that do? One ear not the other. And what did they tell Jesus? We have Abraham to our father. <laughs> They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. So what do these people do? They, they come there because they were sent by the chief priests. That's the reason they show up. So they didn't show up really lit, coming to listen to the word of God. They didn't really want to hear John. They just want to know who he is. Are you the Christ? Or are you that man? And, and he's telling them, no, I'm not. But these are people who figure that they have it together already, that they don't need a Messiah, they don't need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is a form of despising. This is a despising attitude toward preaching. As John the Baptist is preaching, they say, man, we, we got this figured out already. This is an attitude that says, I don't need to hear that. I don't, I don't need that. This is an attitude that says, this doesn't benefit me. Because they, they're saying, we have Abraham already. How does this preaching benefit me? This is a, a, is a people that say, I, I know that already. I, I know that. I, I, I heard that already. Well, you say, what does that have to do with, with us? Because we can have that same attitude. Right. I know this already. Do I have to? Oh. Another sermon on alcohol, I know that already. I know all, I memorized all the alcoholic scripture. Oh, uh, adultery again, I, I know another sermon on adultery, another sermon on fornication, another sermon on, on giving, another sermon on soul winning. I, I know this already. You could develop the, the Pharisees' attitude of we got it all together. We, we know this already. And if you just look at the Bible, the structure of the Bible, that's literally, if you have a, a, a problem with hearing something over and over again, you'll probably have a problem reading the Bible then. Amen. Because that's how the Bible is structured. Amen. Right now, if you're doing the nine chapters a day, you're in the Gospels. Yeah. And you probably just like, I know this already. 
I know how the story ends. Can I just skip to the book of Acts? <laughs> Can I just skip, you know, especially Luke, right? Luke, Luke chapter one. Can I skip this long 81 verses that are in this in this chapter? And, and you just figure like I heard this already. Well, that's how the gospels are set up. It's, it's the same story told over and over, but yet from a different perspective. Some things are added in one that is not in another. That's just how it is. Not only that, you look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament, when God is giving laws, it's a repeat of laws over and over and over. Amen. So the thing is, don't get the attitude that says, oh, I heard this already, or I know this already. That Now you're starting to get an, an attitude of despising. Yeah. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Amen. Paul is saying, now, I know I have spoken about this before. I know I wrote this to you before. I know I preached this to you before. But guess what? Hear it again. That's right. And you know, that's the attitude you should have Amen. when something is reiterated. Maybe I need to hear this again. It, you know, I heard one pastor put it this way, that if you don't need it now, put it in your freezer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Put it in storage, right? Because if you got a freezer, I grew up with a deep freezer in my house, and that thing was probably about four feet tall, but it was deep. You can store a lot in there, and just when you think you wouldn't need it, guess what you have to do? You have to go fishing down in there, and there it is. Amen. Right. So don't have the attitude of, I heard this already. Paul said, for me to write... Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous. He's saying, it don't hurt me to write this over to you. I'm not offended at all by preaching the same thing to you, by writing the same thing to you. It doesn't, it doesn't bug me at all. Not at one point. He said, but for you, it is safe. To hear it over, we should do that. And we should avoid the despising attitude of, of counting the preaching as something, oh, I already know, I, I heard this already. This is such a waste of time. Avoid that, the, the attitude that the Pharisees had, where they figured that they had it all together and didn't need a, a Messiah. Here's another one. Turn to Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. If you turn to the book of Daniel and work your way back, you will have Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. So Daniel and turn to the right. You have Hosea, Joel, Amos. Amos chapter 8. Now, as we go to Amos chapter 8, when we look at this next example, one thing I want to make clear is that the past two examples we look, looked at with John the Baptist and Stephen, they were preaching to a live audience. Here in Amos, he doesn't have a live audience. So I want to let you guys know that so I can keep it in the, in the correct context. But I'm turning here because I want to get these people's attitude. I want you all to look at their attitude toward, um, well, I don't, want to, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but we're going to look at their attitude. Uh, Amos chapter 8, and look at verse 1. The Bible says, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. And the sons of the temple shall be howlings in that day, said the Lord, said the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. Notice this. We're going to focus in on verse 5 and 6. He's talking about these people, people of Israel here. And he says, ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. Notice their attitudes here. Saying, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? And the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shackle great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. Yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. Well, let's, let's look at some key words. Just in case you don't know what's going on, let me, let me break this down. They mentioned in verse five, they said, they say, when will the new moon, when will the new moon be gone? 
the new moon is is one of the ordinances. Is is you can put it in there with one of the holy days. So along with this holy day, not only will you have the new moon, but then you're going to have the Sabbath that follows as well. So that's why they say that we may sell corn, and then this they say, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat. So the Sabbath was also a day of what? No rest. Obviously, there was more than just one Sabbath day. You had the seventh day, but then when it came to the ordinances and the feast days or so, you have multiple Sabbath days, which are to follow as well. So they're wanting the new moon to be done with. They're wanting the Sabbath to be over with. And then at the end, verse 6, look at the last part of verse 6. They say that this is what they want to do, and sell the refuse of the wheat. You say, well, what's the refuse? The refuse is the part of the wheat that is not legit. Because it's not legit, it should be rejected. It should be basically burned or whatever you want to do with it. It's not a legitimate item to say. It looked like wheat, but it's not the part of the wheat that you should sell. So it's the part that should be rejected, but they want to sell the refuse. Now that we got those words out the way, I want you to notice their attitudes that they have toward the things of God. Notice how they are physically there for the ordinances and the, and the, and the days, the new moon and the Sabbath days. They're physically there, but spiritually they're not there. Because notice what they said in verse 5. When will the new moon be gone? What are they saying when they're saying, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? What they're saying is, when will it be over? Yeah. When will the new moon be over? Not just the new moon and the Sabbath. When will the Sabbath be over with? We're ready for it to be over with. It's gone on too long. Now we just need it to be over with. Why? Because they want to get back to doing what they want to do. Look at the text closely. Verse 5 says, saying, when will the new moon be gone? They want it to be over with. Why? That we may sell corn. They want, it, they, they want this Sabbath time to be over with because you can't work. They want to get back to doing what they want to do. They want to get back to their business. They want to get back to their hustle. Not only that, they want to get back to ripping people off. Notice what it says. And the Sabbath. They want the Sabbath to be over with. Why? That we may set forth wheat making the ephah small and the shekel great. What is that talking about? They're ripping people off. They're falsifying what they're selling. Then they just tell you, and falsify the balances by deceit. They're saying, we want this to go get over with. It's going on too long because we want to get back to ripping people off. Not only just rip people off, verse 6, that we may buy the poor for silver. We want to, we want to exchange some people around here. Not only that, and the needy for a pair of shoes. Yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. We really want to sell this part of the wheat that should be utterly rejected and burnt. We want to sell that to people. They want to just get back to ripping people off. That's what they want to do. But notice what I said. Notice their attitudes. When will it be over with? When will it be over with? It's gone on too long. They're physically there for the things of God. But spiritually, what are they saying? When will this be over with? <laughs> oh, it's so, when will the new moon and Sabbath be gone? So we can get back to doing, so we can get back to doing what we want to do. You say, what does that have to do with us? Well, we very well in the context where the preaching is going for can be here physically but spiritually have the same attitude that says, when will the sermon be gone? Yep. When will the sermon end? It's gone on too long. These people were despising the ordinances, the services of God, and yet they just couldn't wait for it to be over. When is it going to be over with? We very well can sit here. How long has he been preaching? Oh, come on. <laughs> We can do that. Yep. And, and ignorantly, although you may not know this, you can develop this attitude that these people have where they're despising the things of God. You yep. can start to despise the preaching. Oh, man. 
another verse. Man, on and on. We don't want to develop that attitude where we're physically here, but spiritually our mind is somewhere else. Yeah. Our mind is on, as they, their mind was where? Ripping people off. Your mind can be on, I need to get to the gym. There's nothing wrong with getting to the gym. Right. Brother Devin's going to take care of that in a few months, right? He's going to get us all in shape. You know, but nothing wrong with hitting the gym. But, you know, you could be here, oh, I just got to get back to my football game. I got to get back to the game. I got to, you know, whatever it is, you have to be careful with just having this attitude of when will it be over with? Amen. When will it be gone? Because that was these people's attitude. This leads me into the next example, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Look at verse 7. Acts chapter 20, the Bible says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continue his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber, where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. This is an interesting story, <laughs> right? How fitting, right, for a, for a sermon like this, right? What do we have here in context? We have the first day of the week. I was out so when someone asked me recently, hey, why do you guys, you know, go to church on uh, the, the first day of the week and not the seventh day? Well, this is what the saints did in the early church. Here's a good example. You ever get asked that? Acts chapter 20, verse 7 says, upon the first day, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Notice what happened? Paul preached unto them. There, this is the service going on. It's, it's preaching going on. Amen. And while Paul is preaching, you know, the Bible mentions here in verse, uh, where is that? In verse 7, it said, speaking about Paul, it said, and continue his speech until midnight. Paul is preaching. Now, it said that he continued his speech until midnight. Now, that doesn't mean it started at midnight, right? Because he's preaching and he continued until midnight. So I'm just throwing out a number. This could have started at 9 p.m., right? And it's going to the midnight hour. And this young man here, he falls asleep while the preaching is going forward. And, and not only that, the Bible says in verse nine, and as Paul was long preaching, what does that mean? Long preaching, preaching for a long time. Amen. Yep. That's, that's what it's talking about. Paul been preaching for a long time. Now here's the thing, as we're talking about despising God's word, I'm not gonna sit here and say that this young man despises God's word. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say that because also you, you have to have a little bit of grace and consider the context. It's 12 a.m. It's 12 a.m. Right. And it didn't just start at 12 a.m. It's been going on before this. So you got to consider like, hey, this alone, this is a long sermon, right? <laughs> but then not only that, we don't know what the young man did before. We don't know if he been working, you know, before. <laughs> he could have worked a double shift. We don't know what he's doing before. So I can understand where it's long preaching and it's 12 a.m. and you're like, hey, buddy, you know, Paul, we're glad to have you in town, but usually at this time of night, I'm in the bed. <laughs> you know, it's good to have him there in town, but kind of long-winded, right? <laughs> so I'm not going to say this guy is despising the word of God because he fell asleep on the message. But I am turning here to use this as an example to show how someone could give off the appearance that they despise the word of God. Yeah. They could be despising the, the, the preaching because it's too long. Because it's the, the, the preacher been going on
for too long. And if you just look at, let's use some progression where we've been at so far. We started with stopping the ears, oh, dang, grunting with the T, you know, gnashing with the T. And then an the attitude that says, oh, I know this already. And then an attitude uh, that says, how long will it go? When will it be over? Eventually, somebody feeling like that, you know what they may just do? I'm taking a nap. I'm going to rest my eyes. That's what some people may do. I'm going to rest my eyes. Now, here's the thing. As I make the application for from here on, I'm not talking about anyone specific in here, okay? I want to give this disclaimer, this, uh, the disclaimer here. It, what they said, the shoe fits, wear it. Listen, I'm not looking at anybody. I can, I can really care less. But I'm just going to preach the Bible here right now, okay? Yeah. And the thing is, and, and I'm going to insert my own, my own applications here as well. That will be outside the Bible, okay? I will clear that out right there as well. But, you know, what I'm about to touch on now is my years of experience just being in church, okay? As far as my memory serves me, I can go back to age five, five or six, when I can recall where I was attending church. There is this time in your life where you one, two, three years old, you don't even know you're in the world, especially as an infant, newborn. You don't know you're in the world. You have no conscience of what's going on. But there comes a moment in your life where it hits you that, you know, if, if this is a fitting word that, hey, I'm a human being or I exist, right? right. There comes this point where you realize what's going on. Yeah. I can go back to age five and I remember attending church, right? I remember age six attending Sunday school. I can remember attending vacation Bible school every August. I can remember going to a choir rehearsal. I can remember being in the youth choir. I can remember going to with my mother to choir rehearsal. I was always in church, as you can tell. Uh, not only that, I, I can remember Friday night Bible study. I remember Wednesday daytime Bible study. I, I remember a revival that was for a week long of a revival. I can go back to age five, and now I'm age 37. Lord willing, next month be 38. If you do the math on that, on those years, that is 32 years to, to this day, 32 years of being in church. You could, you could do the same. For you, however long you've been in church, think about that, and hey, that's a good accomplishment that you've been in church, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is, that's a good accomplishment, right? That's good. But what I'm saying is I have seen a lot of things in churches. And what I'm going to speak about now is just from my experience. The type of church I grew up in, it was a Baptist church. True Right Missionary Baptist Church, 311 East 95th Street, Chicago, Illinois. I still remember the, uh, the address, right, from when I was a little kid. Never forget it, right? But I also remember the service as well. It was a Baptist church, but jokingly, people would call it a Bathecostal church. Any of you all heard that title, Bathecostal? It's a Baptist church by title, but when you go in there, the service, you'll think you was in a Pentecostal church, right? And at this time, people are running around, they're shouting, doing praise and worship, the choir is on fire, everybody is on fire, the pastor is running around, everybody's running around, and then when the preaching comes forward, everybody's sleep. <laughs> Uh, or I would say a lot of people are asleep. And, and it hit me as I got older. I'm like, man, you know, wow. Even in college, I, I attended church. I went away from college, but yet I was still in, 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 uh, in college, but I went to a church then. And I just put it all together. I said, you know what? They're probably falling asleep because all the energy that they're putting forward when you're running around the church and shouting and everything like it's so much energy that you're burning that when the mellow time comes and everything comes down and the word is going forth, you start to just like, you, you, uh, your tie can start to sink down and eventually just fall out. I've seen this many times where the pastor is preaching, but then the, the half the deacon board is asleep during the preaching. Not only that, right behind the pastor is the choir stand. Have the choir, because of so much energy singing, what are they doing? They're asleep. <laughs> right? And, and you know what it gives an appearance? It gives the appearance that people just don't take the word of God serious. Yep. Yeah. 
it gives the appearance that this is not important. Yep. Anything you go to sleep on, it's, it's not important. You know, and for the life of me, and as I, as I mentioned, I'm speaking about my years from, from five all the way up to 37 now. If it hits you, it hits you. But for me, I don't understand why I come to church and sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why I come to church? It's the most uncomfortable place. Here's the thing, when I sleep, I don't want to hear somebody yelling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hear somebody yelling. You know what you're going to hear, hear up here? Yelling. Yeah. That irritates me. I want to sleep in peace. I like to sleep with the lights off. The lights are on in here. I don't want to do that. Amen. Right? So sitting straight up, that is not a comfortable position. I was just on an airplane uh, a couple days ago and trying to sleep on a plane. The most uncomfortable position, sitting straight up or head on the window and trying to turn and push a headrest is so uncomfortable. Why would you come to church and sleep? Amen. My thing is, I would rather just stay at home and I can sleep in my bed. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you from coming to church, but here's the thing. If you're going to come to church, give God your undivided attention and Amen. don't sleep on the Word of God. That's right. Something else I experienced over the years, as I've mentioned, this is from age 5 up to 37 right now. But something I, I called on to over the years, constant walking. Constant walking during the message. Constant walking. Now here's the thing, especially in a church like this, if you have an infant, if you have a, a baby that you have to take care of because they're hungry, you know, they need to get changed, or obviously I have children, so sometimes nothing is wrong with them. They're just irritated, they're just crying, they're just being annoying, right? So what, what do you have to do with them? You have to get up. You have to walk. You have to take them out. You have to calm them down and get them situated. So I'm not even talking about a situation like that, okay? Then not only that, if you're elderly, as you're older, you're elderly, there are things that your body used to be able to hold that you can't hold anymore. So you know what you have to do? You have to excuse yourself. You have to get up and walk. That is understandable because of old age. It just happens. Naturally, that is what's going to happen. But I'm talking about our youth. I'm talking about young people. I'm talking about young adults. I'm talking about adults as well. People who can contain their walking. That is something that we ought to be careful about as the word of God is going forward. You just walking to and fro. Just a, a look, look like a circus around here. Just as if it's some concert where people are just walking on some sporting event where you're just walking doing the preaching. Now here's the thing that I'll, I'll share with you, my rule for, for my family, and, and, and we're not perfect. You know, with, with a couple of our kids, they, they get here and the first thing they want to do is play. They, they run off, right? But my rule is that as soon as we get to church, hit the restroom. Hit the restroom immediately. As soon as you get that, now does it always happen? No, I'm on the door, or my wife is dealing with something, it's gonna slip us, right? And then one of the kids, I have to use the restroom, soon as church starts. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> you know, but the thing is, you say, what's the big deal about that? Well, because you don't wanna be a distraction. All right. You don't wanna be a distraction. It's enough going on while you're standing up here preaching. It's, a, it's enough trying to keep your train of thought. It's enough trying to see, uh, you know, not that this is what you're doing for, but you're seeing people's faces. It's enough dealing with the looks that you get. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's enough already. Then you have people walking, understandably so. It's, it's understanding, but if you, if you can contain it, then contain your walking. Because you don't want to be a distraction to what's going on up here as well. We're looking at a progression of what's going on. We talked about this attitude of when will it be over with? It's been going on too long. And then when people just say, oh, this is too long, then when people just say, oh, it's boring. And then because it's boring, you just say, oh, I'll go ahead and, and, and rest my eyes. Then you say, oh, I'll just, I'll just uh, take a walk. Well, here's the thing. 
when people just figure, oh, I, I just can't contain, I, I gotta get up and walk. You know, you know, I, I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. I don't go to the restroom with anyone other than my kid when I have to take him to the restroom. So what you do in the restroom, that is on you. I can care less. But here's the thing, it is a, it, this is very wicked if you just can't contain and surge, when you just consider the preaching, oh, so boring, oh, so long, where you just say, I have to get up and walk, and you're just in the restroom just clowning around. Yep. That, that's a very wicked thing, where you're just in there, if you're a young lady, or an adult, whatever, if you just, oh, I can't be in service, oh, it's boring, let me just go to the restroom, and you're in there fixing your makeup, putting on lip gloss, fixing your hair or what's up. That, why? Because the, the preaching, are you despising the preaching? That, that's a very wicked thing and something that we need to be cautious about when you're just yeah. sitting there clowning around. Even a young man, if you in there, oh man, I, I get sick and tired of just sitting, it feels like the sermons are so long, oh, I need to go to the bathroom and you in there just making sure your hair is all slick and greasy and making sure your eyebrows are straight, you, you know, doing all that. <laughs> You know, that's, that's something you need to be careful about because that's a very wicked attitude to have when you just look at the word of God and just say, oh, it's so boring, I just got to get out of here. Now, I'm going to be honest. That was something that we did when we were in school. Right. You had a class that you wanted to get out of. I, I had many classes I wanted to get out of. Uh, for an example, a chemistry. Right. I wasn't a fan of chemistry. Amen. Biology. Trigonometry. Geometry. You name it. <laughs> I just wanted to get out of it, right? I, I sat in there, but there were times where I'm just like, I, I want to get out of class. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because we probably all did that. Can I have a hall pass you? Oh, I can't hold it. Please. <laughs> and then the teacher give you a pass. And then you go in the restroom, you see guys in there just brushing their hair in the mirror. You know, and then not only that, they're getting the tissue and they're wetting it and they're trying to stick it up to the ceiling. Just a bunch of clowning going on in the restroom. Why? Because they despise being in the classroom. Yep. And you know, that's what people do. And it's something we just need to be careful about where you're despising the word of God. You just say, oh, I, I, just, gotta, I just gotta get out of here. I gotta, I gotta get out of here because it's just going on too long. It's irritating. Let me just get up and walk and just clown around in the restroom. Like I said, young men, young women, adults, whatever. I don't know what you're doing in the restroom, but if this is what you're doing, you, you need to check yourself. It's a very wicked thing, Amen. okay? You say, what are you trying to do, start a cult? Trying to tell us when to go to the restroom? Trying to lock us up, trying to Jim Jones us? No, <laughs> right? I'm just, hey, here's the thing. This is the most important. Isn't this the highlight of the day? Amen. Isn't this the main reason we come here? Yeah. yeah. This is the main reason we come. Yes, for fellowship. Yes, to see him. Yes, to see each other. But the main entree is the word of God. That's right. That is what it's all about. So I'm not, I'm not trying to start some cult here. Just have a healthy respect for the word of God. Yeah. Right. Have a healthy respect for the preaching of God's word when it comes forth. You say, well, I don't want to despise God's word. I want to have a, a, a healthy respect for God's word. How should I approach God's word when it's coming forth? Well, I just got one verse for you. You don't have to turn there, but Acts chapter 17, verse 10, the Bible says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Notice this, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You know, I, my favorite part of this verse is the end where it says they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so, but then also the most important is the very first part, how they received the word. It said with all readiness of mind, which means that they were locked in. They weren't interested in having any type of distractions. I'm sure they had the, their, their form of distractions going on, but these people were locked in. They were ready to hear the word of God. They didn't despise the word of God. They heard it. They were no, they were ready to receive the word of God. And as I mentioned, you know, expect this from the world for people not to have a respect, a healthy respect for the word of God. 
and expect them to just walk out. Expect them not to want to have any dealings. But remember who this is written to. It's written to the church, Amen. not to despise father's signs. So this is something that we have to be on guard against. Do not despise the prophesying. Despise not prophesying. Is that a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this day and the exhortation that we read in this uh, letter inspired by you, Lord, used through Paul, Father, and I uh, ask, Lord, that we uh, will not despise your word and that we have a healthy respect for your word. Forgive us, Lord, for any time we may have been uh, short in this area, Father, uh, ignorantly or even knowingly, Father. I pray, Lord, that our hearts will get right with you. Uh, bless us, Lord, as we leave this evening. Give us your traveling grace and mercy until we meet again, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.